Hello, everyone. Good morning. Let's start. We are on chapter 14, DNA structure and function. The main learning objective is to understand certain key experiments that helped us to identify if uh, DNA was the genetic material. So this is uh, between before 1950s. Uh, we'll talk about a scientist who proposed the Chagraf rules. His name was Chagraf. Uh, we'll understand the central dogma of molecular biology proposed by Watson and Crick. We'll revise the structure of DNA. And uh, we'll talk about one important experiment done by Messelsen and Stahl. And uh, we'll also learn how DNA makes a copy of itself. Why is our knowledge about DNA so important? Why is DNA uh, knowledge so important? Because DNA is the blueprint of life. And once we understood how DNA works, we were able to manipulate it. So all the evolutionary phylogenetic trees were kind of rewritten after the discovery of uh, DNA structure and function, sequencing the DNA and so forth. It has completely revolutionized our food supply and also our meat supply because most of the food that we eat is all GMO foods. And that is rooted in uh, our discovery of DNA structure, forensics revolutionized, you know, DNA fingerprinting, printing, paternity test has uh, changed the way we solve our crimes. In the medical field, again, all the diagnostic tools, gene therapy, uh, gene editing is all possible now. And also to identify genetic disorders ahead of time. So again, big uh, application there. And in biotechnology, you know, there's lots of enzymes that have been made through uh, DNA technology, um, bioremediation, biofuels. So the list goes on and on. This is super important. The, the, this lecture is the foundation for most of the big discoveries in biology. And here's a, a very good experiment that proved um, that in uh, see streptococcus pneumoniae is the bacteria. So the S strain is pathogenic. So if you should infect the uh, mouse with the S strain, the mouse will die. Whereas the R strain is pa uh, non-pathogenic. It is not virulent, it will not cause disease. However, if you heat kill the S strain, mix it with the R strain and then inject the mouse, it died. So now this proved the genetic material has uh, transferred from the pathogenic to non-pathogenic somehow, and that phenomena is called transformation. So Griffith, Griffin experiment is an important experiment. The next experiment, so the question at that time before 1950s was, is DNA the genetic material or is it the protein? So all the scientists were debating about that. And then Hershey and Chase comes and does this very simple experiment to prove that DNA is the genetic material. So here's a picture of the experiment. So the, this is the bacteria. Bacteria can be infected by a phage. So they are called as um, bacteriophage. So you can either label the DNA. So it's P32 labeled DNA in one batch. And in the other batch, the phage protein is uh, labeled with S35. And then the bacteria is allowed to uh, undergo, you know, the, the bacteriophage uh, lives in it, enters it, and then they grind up the sample and they saw that in the pellet uh, had P32. So this proved that DNA is actually entering the cell and that was the genetic material. Another huge discovery around that time is uh, made by Chagraf. So Chagraf, uh, when he measured the amount of uh, bases, he always found the combination of A's and G's 
were always equal to P and C. And this led to the base pairing rule of A base pairing with T and G base pairing with C. Hydrogen bonds. So that's another important discovery. And then comes along the four people who got the Nobel Prize for deciphering the structure of DNA, uh, Watson and Crick, uh, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. So Rosalind Franklin is the first scientist to take a picture of uh, DNA by a technique called X-ray crystallography. And then they get a sneak peek at it. And that's how they find out that DNA is a spherical molecule. It is double-stranded and so forth. So even though Watson and Creek does not do much experimentation in the lab, they were very clever at deciphering the data from other labs. Well, anyways, the Nobel Prize is offered, but she's uh, Rosalind is dead by then. So they don't give a Nobel Prize for dead people. So let's uh, revise the structure of DNA. DNA is a polymer. The monomer that makes DNA is called as a nucleotide. A nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, a carbon, five carbon sugar that is missing an oxygen. That's why it's called deoxy. Ribo. And then it has a nitrogenous base. It is rich in nitrogen. So there are two types of nitrogenous bases. Purins are double ring structures. Pyrimidins are single ring structures. Pyrimidins are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Purins are adenine and guanine. Very soon you'll realize the importance of the single ring and double ring, because in order to keep the width of the DNA, a double ring structure has to be paired with a single ring structure. That's why G goes with C and adenine goes with thymine. Uracil is only found in RNA. So the bond between the nitrogenous bases is a hydrogen bond. Whereas the bond between the sugar and the phosphate is a covalent bond. So you can see um, in the second position, if you number the carbon, one, two, three, four, five, in the second carbon, it's missing an oxygen in uh, DNA. That's why it's called deoxyribose sugar. RNA has it. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. It looks like a twisted ladder. And it is held together by the complementary base pairing of A going with T, G going with C. The two strands are held together by uh, hydrogen bonds. Another very interesting thing to note is DNA is anti parallel. So the two strands of DNA, they don't go in the same direction. One goes five prime to three prime. The other one will go three prime to five prime. So in other words, the A and T, the T is actually flipped in order to form the uh, hydrogen bonds here. So these are weak hydrogen bonds. That's where DNA can come apart. It's called DNA melting. Whereas there's strong covalent bonds in the sides of the ladder. So the rungs of the ladder are bases. The sides of the ladder are sugar and phosphates held together by covalent bonds. The main difference between uh, DNA in prokaryotes and in eukaryotes is that in eukaryotes, the DNA is very complicated. They're usually found in chromosomes. For example, us, we have 20, uh, 46 chromosomes. Uh, so the DNA is highly organized and it's protected in the nucleus. Whereas in prokaryotes, the DNA is called naked DNA. It's just hanging around like a loop uh, in a region called nucleoid region. So it's a circular DNA that prokaryotes have. That's why most of the genetic um, research was, is done in prokaryotes because it's much simpler. This picture is showing how DNA is packaged in a cell. So here we see the double strand of DNA, the double helix. It will wrap itself around proteins called histones. There's, there's like nine histone proteins for every turn. 
and then the whole thing kind of folds back on itself like a string and it gets condensed it's condensed further and further to form these egg shaped chromosomes that we usually see in prophase of a cell cycle before then if the cell is not dividing this the dna will be unraveled and it will be thread like And here's the most important slide in biology that talks about the flow of uh, genetic information in a cell. Again, a huge discovery proposed by Watson and Crick. Um, the terminology is when DNA wants to make a copy of itself, it is called DNA replication. So this happens in yes phase of the cell cycle. When DNA is very precious, it will never leave the nucleus. So when it wants to express itself, it will make a messenger RNA copy of itself and send it out into the cytoplasm. So that process is called transcription, DNA to RNA. You're making a polymer of RNA, right? So the enzyme is RNA polymerase, whereas here it's DNA polymerase. And then when the messenger RNA transcript is used for making a protein, you know, there's a translation happening. They're going for, from a nucleic acid language to a protein language. Then that is called translation. We'll study that in our next uh, lecture. So this is the terminology. Uh, always remember this. So the next question is, how does DNA replicate? Again, there were several theories uh, at that time. So one theory said, when DNA wants to make a copy of itself, it is both strands are conserved. You know, this is the parental strand and this is the daughter strand. And then another theory said, this is the theory that uh, Watson proposed. He says one of the strands will be preserved and it will act as the template for the daughter strand to be made. So that is called semi-conservative method. Dispersive, uh, dispersive method is when DNA is copied you know, there's this alternating mother strand, daughter strand, like that, it's dispersed. However, experiments proved that DNA is uh, replicated or it will make a copy of itself. It's also called DNA duplication by semi-conservative method. And this experiment, Hershey and Chase, uh, sorry, Messelcell and Stahl experiment, it's uh, known to be the most beautiful experiment in biology because it's so simple that proved semi-conservative method of DNA replication. So here you can see, uh, again, it was done in E. coli bacteria. So when they grew the first generation E. coli in heavy nitrogen, heavy nitrogen, the, the, both the DNA strands are parental. So when you do a centrifugation, this is the band density here. So it's very heavy. So you allow it to grow for second generation, but this time you add, uh, N14 in the medium for labeling. And then now when it, uh, the density is lighter than the parental strand. So you can see in this picture here. So this is the parental strand. Both are heavy labeled with N15. First generation, because the bacteria was grown in N14, it has one parental strand and one light strand, one heavy strand and one light strand. So the density reduced. The generation after that, the third, the second generation, it becomes lighter. So there's a heavy band and a light band. So this band is following through and the daughter strand is there. So think about it. This experiment proved that um, semi-conservative method of DNA replication is what's going on in the cells. Huge discovery. So let's uh, look at the process of how DNA makes a copy of itself. So you can see this is the parental strand of DNA. Uh, it will, all the hydrogen bonds will break when, when it wants to replicate. It's called DNA melting. The two strands will come apart. And then one strand will act as a template for the daughter strand to be made. So by complementary base pairing, it will make the daughter strand. And this happens during the S phase of the cell cycle. It's amazing, the, the process of replication. I'm always in awe as to how they discovered the process. So the parental strand is melting and opening up. It's called as a replication fork when it opens up. So that's the replication fork. 
and one strand will go in one go. Whereas the this is called leading strand, and the next dotted strand will be made in pieces. I'll tell you all that in a bit. So overall, there are three main steps. So think and think you're making a copy of DNA. So you have parental DNA and it's time to divide. So the DNA is making a copy. The overall process happens in three steps. There is an enzyme called DNA helicase that will unwind the double helix, breaking all the hydrogen bonds so that it's single stranded. The main enzyme that makes the DNA copy is called DNA polymerases. There's several of them. So DNA polymerases, after the helicase opens up, this part is called replication fork. So that's the replication fork. And the leading strand is made uh, three prime to five prime direction because this is what DNA polymerase can add in nucleotide two at the three prime end. And it, it goes in one go. It's continuous. Whereas the lagging strand it may, is made in small pieces. DNA polymerase also has like a starting trouble. So it needs a little bit of RNA primer so that the green one you're seeing is the RNA primer. Then RNA uh, DNA polymerase comes and does the complementary base pairing. And it, the strand that is shooting towards the replication fork, this is called replication fork, is continuous. The other strand, it's more complicated. It's made in small pieces called Okasaku fragments, named after the scientist who discovered it. So, and then these small fragments uh, will um, stick back together by an enzyme called DNA ligase. So main enzymes is helicase will open the strands. There's an enzyme called topoisomerase that will make sure it doesn't get wound up. DNA primase will add the primate, primer. And then uh, DNA polymerase will do complementary base pairing. And then after, in the lagging strand, the, all the gaps will be stuck back together by an enzyme called DNA ligase. So once it uh, does its replication, the RNA polymerase will detach from the strand. And here's a summary slide that explains the different steps of uh, DNA replication. I'm just going to read from this uh, overhead here. Helicase unwinds the parental strand. I forgot to mention there's proteins called single stranded binding proteins that will make sure the DNA doesn't stick back together. So these are the pink balls that you're seeing here. Single stranded binding proteins. The leading strand is synthesized continuously in the five to three prime direction. The lagging strand is made in small pieces called Okasaki fragments and then um, the DNA ligase will come and join these small pieces together. And here's a little animation. I'll show you a video also. And here's a summary of all the enzymes. So you can see how complicated and how what a big discovery this is. Uh, there is an, another enzyme. Uh, it's also a DNA polymerase. I thought this was very interesting. This will correct the error during replication. So when D DNA complementary base pairing is happening, sometimes the wrong base will be attached. So here the enzyme will come, read, it will go over, and then when it finds a, a mistake, see here it's called nucleotide excision. So sometimes thymine and thymine can come together and form dimers, which is not good. This usually happens with UV light. That's why UV light can mutate the DNA in our skin cells uh, that can lead to cancer. So it's called thymine dimers. So this uh, uh, proof reading by DNA polymerase is very important. So in other words, DNA makes a copy of itself, DNA polymerase, and then it's not done. It will check to see if there's any mistakes. If there's any mistakes, it will cut it out and put the right base there. Amazing, isn't it? This is also another uh, interesting facet. Uh, it's called telom telomas. So the ends of the chromosome have a specific sequence. So this is the sequence, repeating sequence. It kind of protects the ends of the uh, chromosomes. And then telomerase is the enzyme that makes sure 
because DNA polymerase cannot go up to the end when it's making a copy of itself. It kind of falls short. And telomerase will keep on adding or extending the DNA. The common analogy would be the aglet in your shoelaces, you know, like the, the tip of your shoelace will make sure your shoelace doesn't fray. That's the analogy that everybody gives. It's closely accurate. So telomeres are protecting the ends of the chromosome. And aging is connected to it. This was discovered by Elizabeth Blackburn. She got a Nobel Prize. It's a huge discovery because it's implicated that people age. You know, we all age, fall sick and die. It's because our DNA is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And telomerase, the enzyme that's supposed to extend it is not working. And uh, when DNA replication happens in prokaryotes, so this is an electron microscopy picture. Uh, this is called origin of replication, where you can see a bubble in the microscope. And it's very, very fast in prokaryotes because there's several uh, origin of uh, replications. In prokaryotes, origin of replication is single. In eukaryotes, it's multiple. Rate of replication, thousands of nucleotides here. It's a very small genome. Here it is slow. Chromosome is circular here. Chromosome is linear here. Telomerase is present in eukaryotes and it's absent here. So these are the most important points in this chapter. And I hope that was clear for you.